Welcome back. Let's go ahead and get started with session 15 of 120C, 220C. Um, today we're going to spend a lot of time talking about those search strategies that we keep on talking about, talking about, but never quite getting to because we're spending some more time just thinking about evaluation and different ways of evaluating entire forms versus doing individual panels on forms and different ways of making our evaluation uh, getting better. Uh, we are going to kind of look at some more evaluation tools as we come up. We're going to look at tools for uh, evaluating the energy efficiency of different forms, as well as like daylight expenditures of different forms. So a lot of different sort of uh, evaluation tools that are out there. But we're going to kind of detour a little bit today and just think about this overall notion of searching and really the most efficient way of searching and the different tools that are available for you in Dynamo. As many of you will note, we are actually getting very close to the end of the quarter. And uh, this quarter is actually especially short in that uh, the way the Memorial Day holiday stacks out, as well as the final day of classes, which won't be a day of classes, because that's the day before final week, we're actually going to have 19 sessions. Okay, so things are actually coming up pretty quick here in terms of like uh, finishing up. What we'll do for you next time is I'll lay out kind of the final assignment. It won't be a killer. I'm going to sort of be very hard, try very hard to go through and make sure that it's not one of those gigantic, like integrative, you slave over it for five weeks and try to pull it all together and stuff like that. So it will have a little bit to it, but it won't be a killer in the scheme of things. So uh, don't be too frightened by like what's ahead. We'll try to kind of make it a very focused experience, give some choices about what you want to explore, but also uh, kind of narrow it down to the point where it's doable because you have a lot of other places where you're asked to be very creative right now and uh, integrate some things together. So uh, we'll try to keep it very focused for what we're doing here. Okay. Um, in terms of our recap, last time we spent a lot of time just really thinking about the whole notion of solar analysis and for surfaces, really how to go through and apply this sort of approach of um, moving through, trying to test a lot of different things, picking a best input value, and then using that value to regenerate the form and then evaluate the individual panels on that form. Kind of a two-step kind of approach to the whole thing. And we're going to continue to use that approach. We're going to, like uh, for today, look at evaluating some overall forms, flexing them quite a bit. But as we go through doing these things uh, to try and figure out the best overall form, after we find that form, we go through and pick the best value and then regenerate the form using that value and analyze it, colorize it, whatever it is you want to do to go through and indicate it. But that sort of like oh, approach tends to work out to support a lot of the different types of analysis we want to do. So that whole idea of looping to find the best alternatives and really in terms of what we're looking at right now, what we're going to be doing is, especially today, looking at different strategies for doing the looping to evaluate the alternatives. Once we go through and kind of do some looping with different types of efficiency, we can choose that best alternative, choose the one that we think is sort of the one that fits the criteria best, and then generate it and analyze it. It'll apply to any of these different search strategies. Yeah? So on the last one, when we were varying like rotation for mm -hmm. solar analysis, is there a way to easily rotate uh, a set of objects that you had around some axis? It depends on like just how it's set up inside Revit. Right. So in Revit, we can go ahead and put a rotation parameter on specific like family types, mm -hmm. okay? That kind of works even for like your part. If your part had been generated as a family, then we could put a parameter in that would let us kind of vary it there. Um, if it was generated as a bunch of math, it's really trying to do some sort of transform to it after the fact. Right. Actually, I should take that back. No, there even is a way to do that. Even if you're doing it out of the lines and stuff like yeah. that, in Dynamo, there's like some transform nodes that let you put either an offset or a rotation right. in there. You can either put an axis or an origin point and rotate it around that. So I think the but thing to do. How would you select? So I guess you would just have to, you could input, like if you identify lines, you could input your origin, your 0, 0, 0 point. You could input that as your origin and then say rotate. Exactly. So what I do is in your node that was originally generating the lines, something like that, go ahead and have something in it where after you sort of loft the surface, you know, you basically have this option of offsetting it somehow, translating it somehow, or rotating it. And then depending upon whether it's a zero value or a rotation value that you found, put it in there and then regenerate the surface and translate it. 
because it'd be easier to sort of translate the re translate the lofted surface as opposed to trying to translate the lines and loft that surface. Right. Yeah, yeah that would be tough. But a uh, surface is uh, when you do surface by loft and you give it some lines. That is a family, or what is that? Oh, actually, even that as a dynamo object, you can translate that. Okay. So you could rotate that object, or you can. Yeah, we should look in there in Dynamo. It's there's, there's going to be like translate and rotate. Okay, so you can object. do that with the Dynamo object, and then from that generate your quads, and then generate. And then put the panels in. After that, and do exactly. it because you never want to create the surface that you don't actually have. You have to you know, wait until you have what you want. Exactly. Your maximum. You'd be, you'd, you're always better off to go ahead and let the math in Dynamo do as much as it can to evaluate all the alternatives, and only generate the panels and Revit after you're pretty good, because you know. There's no harm in it other than it just takes a lot of time. So there's yeah, no reason to do it just because it's going to be flashing around a lot in the background, but it wouldn't necessarily give any better. Okay. What we're going to do today is I am going to loop around and do some generating of things in Revit only because in Revit I want to go through and twist and deform the Revit object and try to evaluate the parameters that are coming out of Revit. So it's kind of this issue of if you're going to use Revit as a calculator, and it's a pretty good geometric calculator, then we do a lot of transactions starting and ending and twisting the objects there, as opposed to just doing the Dynamo by just kind of evaluating the math and looking at the surface directly. Okay, so let's talk about some examples that'll sort of start uh, like illustrating this. And we'll start with this whole notion of this flexing tower and look at it with a single input. We'll look at a couple different towers. You might remember we started by just sort of looking at a simple box, something like that, and flexing that. We're going to go ahead and look at some different tower shapes, where the idea is, using the list map, we can exhaustively go through some different test parameters, and then decide what we're going to return, a single value, or many values, or even go through and try to write an Excel file to kind of capture those values. Okay? So we're first going to look at that. We're then going to look at kind of flexing pairs of values, so as opposed to a single input. In this case, I have a single input, single output. Here I have a single input, multiple outputs. Now I start to have multiple inputs. And I can then have a single output or multiple outputs, depending upon what you want. Okay, so we'll look at that exhaustively. Then we'll look at the while well loop and what it's good for, because the while well loop actually has some nice uh, kind of properties for only searching a part of a space so that as soon as you go off kilter, as soon as you exceed one of your boundary conditions, you don't bother searching anymore. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. We'll start with 15.1 and just kind of play around as we go. So I'm going to go over to a nearby instance of Revit and see if you have 15.1. It's always Noel who tells me like that I haven't shared it yet. I think it is shared now, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I count on my crutches like there's specific people to tell me different things every time. Okay, so for doing this 15.1, we can come through and use oh uh, really it's pretty much any of these different objects. Let's see what I have out here for you 15.1. We could do, let's just do the twisting tower, and then we'll go through it. I'll do the triangular one instead. We'll look at some different sort of shapes we can put in here. Looks like I already have a triangular tower in here. Let me zoom out a little bit. We can do this with either one. We have twisting rectangular mass or twisting triangular mass. Either one will work. The idea with both these different shapes is that these shapes have some parameters to them. And if you thought about, oh, designing some new tower that's going to be on the New York skyline or the San Francisco skyline, we could go ahead and think about some high level things that we want to go through and meet. And we could say that relative to some tower shape, we have some uh, property and some boundary that we can go through and build it on. There's often some sort of a height constraint. But Within those things, there's also some things that are typically driving your program. We could say that, oh, we want to have a certain number of square feet that we need to achieve, or that relative to what we're trying to achieve with the tower, we want to think about, oh, either maximizing the views out of the offices, or 
you know, maximizing the solar potential for the different services or cutting down on the wind and the forces that are going through the tower. So this is sort of really based on a couple of different examples. This little guy over here, that's uh, kind of like the twisting torso. So one of Calatrava's buildings. But this has a couple of different sort of parameters to it. We have a twist, we have a top width, a top depth, a building height. So depending on what you want, the idea is we just have some parametric shapes here we want to evaluate. Then you should go through and try to change things around. We can go through and say, okay, this is gonna have like a nice even twist. This is really defined just as really two different rectangles and twists between the two. Let me say, oh, I'll make it 90 degrees. That's interesting, it won't let me do that. That's kind of just a piece of my programming. Let me try making 80 degrees, I bet that'll work. 80 would work. Looks like as soon as I get above 90, it's gonna give me trouble, or up to 90, it's gonna give me trouble. Okay. But the yeah, idea is you can create these different parametric forms that might be these building shapes. And if you wanna look at these forms and really how they were created, you can edit the families. And take a look. And if I kind of spin this around a little bit, you'll see that it's really just a couple of different reference lines and profiles where we sort of have the height and the width kind of defined, and then we have these twist parameters that are really just determining how much things are moving around. But it all starts here with just trying to set up some basic boundary conditions. I did this with a Revit object. You could have done this actually in Dynamo if you wanted to by going through and kind of defining different boundaries and kind of introducing the twist that way and then locking them together to kind of create an object. But this is how I did it in Revit. Okay, so if I go bopping back over here, let's see if we can go through and use these. Okay, this is the little twisting tower over here. Let's go through and kind of take a look at our twisting tower though. The twisting tower is kind of an interesting one. This one over here is actually based on the form of the Shanghai Tower. So if you kind of paid attention to that building, a rough approximation, but that's pretty close in terms of what's going on. It basically has the shape of almost like a guitar pick, kind of a rounded triangle, and it rotates up at a pretty constant curvature. It also tapers as you go on. And the idea behind that building was that by going through introducing this twist and this taper, they originally did this with a lot of wind tunnel experimentation. Now you can kind of prove it visually too, that we were able to reduce the wind loads on the building quite a bit. And that in turn was able to allow them to reduce the amount of steel and make a much more sustainable building. So a much lower top, use a lot more less resources to go through and kind of construct it. So this shape that I have right here is actually kind of pretty flexible in that this one can be flexed a lot of different ways. For example, if I put the top radius of, oh, I'll put it 100, I can make something that's really distended at the top. Okay. Or I could go through and try to introduce some relationships between these. I won't introduce them just yet. But we can go through and, for example, say, well, let's do this. Let's go through and say that we'll allow this thing to flex. But if we wanted to use a relationship, for example, that the top rotation and the bottom rotation, or the top um, radius and the bottom radius, and the middle one had to be somewhere between the two, so that it would be a constant kind of a taper, we could do that. How I would do that is, for example, edit this family. You'll see there's all sorts of different parameters here. And if I want to introduce a formula that relates the two together, oh, for example, if I want to say the midi radius is equal to the top radius plus the bottom radius divided by two, I could do that. And that would actually kind of introduce that constant taper. So let me say that mid radius is this top radius plus the base radius. Okay. Always very sensitive to spacing and capitalization, so watch out for that. Okay, so that's giving me some value. Notice that mid radius is off the table now with a, a variable like a chain, because always we pair a formula to be determined. I could also, if I wanted to make sure that that mid height was again between the top height and the base height, although it looks like my base height is zero right now, and I just don't even have it in there. Thanks for attention. 
That is to say, the mid height is going to just be the same as just hot height divided by 2. Now, why is that? What is going on? That one's there, that one's there. So if I change this to 400, that's 200. <laughs> ah, but a little bit of error in this going on. Instance parameters can't be used in type parameter formulas. So let's kind of think about this. And this has to do with this mid radius. Okay, and really how it's defined right now, I can tell it's a little bit different right now. What's happening is I'm allowing that, like the top height that I think, or the top radius and the bottom radius are instance parameters, they can change. My mid radius, I guess that would have to be an instance parameter also. So let me cancel out of that for a second. Let me go to mid radius just to kind of check that out and say, hey, you're not a type parameter, you're actually an instance parameter. That way, if those change, then uh, individually, that the mid radius can change too. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing is I'm just choosing that, let's say modify the parameter. Okay, now it's a very squishy looking tower. That's not a very attractive one. Let's go to and make the top height back up to 500. Okay, but so now we have a tower that no matter what degree of rotation and what degree of taper, in this case I'm sort of uh, flailing out, let me make that like oh, 50 at the top and make it 100 at the bottom. Some basic shape there. Say so, okay. And I can load that back in too. And again, you don't have to do this. This is just sort of ways of uh, kind of using it. But the idea is we're going to simulate some different building forms and try to evaluate these different building forms. And let's think about the <coughs> variables we have available to us. Over here, for this one, for all mass forms, you always have gross surface area, gross volume, and gross floor area. Although you see gross floor area doesn't show anything right now. <coughs> Over here, I think you're going to have the same things. I'm going to have, again, gross surface area, gross volume, and no gross floor area just yet, but we can get that out. Now, we could also go through and evaluate them other ways. We could go through and evaluate the solar insulation. We can go through and kind of figure out some different values that we want to pull out. But these are all values that are available for any of the different masses. Now, what gross floor area is not in, you know, available yet. It's just that these masses don't have any floors to them, so if we want to put some mass floors in there, we can. Let me just check this to see if we actually have some masses. Or, you know, looks like I don't have very much available to me just yet. So I only have like a level one and level two right now, and if I want to go through and add some more, we can make them available. Then we could go through and compute some more floors. To do that, what I can do to set this up is I can add some levels. And for adding levels, there's a lot of ways to do this. If I want to say, just choose the level tool, and then pick a floor to floor offset. Uh, what do I have for the first one? It's probably just 10 feet down there. Got about 10 feet right now. OK, so. This is just a little bit of Revit tomfoolery. I'll upload this file so we're all working with the same one in just a minute in case, as I've been playing around, you've fallen off. Let's say 10 feet. I can just kind of click there and offset and get another uh, 10 feet, another 10 feet. You can go through and do it that way. I often do it this way if it's not a very tall building. However, if this is a very tall building, if you've got 100 stories to deal with or something like that, you're probably going to get bored with doing it this way. So the array tool may be a better way to do it. Is there any way to make a, a floor adapt, or a level adapt to an object? Say it again. Is there any way to make a level adapt to an object? Like if I wanted to say I have a Revit object that has like four planes at certain heights, and I change those as instance parameters, is there any way to get your levels to adapt oh, yeah. to those? 
this. You can lock the level to that plane. And it'll, and it'll move with yeah. the object, yeah. rather it's than locking an object to a level that you can Exactly. It's a two-way relationship. Interesting. Cool. Yeah, so if you, if you lock a level to the bottom of something and you move the something, it'll move the level. Kind of strange. But it works. <laughs> OK, so if I was going to, for example, go through and array those, what I could do is say array. I'm going to choose that object. And what am I going to do? Where's my array out there? Okay. There it is. OK, I'm going to basically go to the second one. I'm going to, oh, I'm going to make like 70 of them or something like that. I don't think I'll need all 70 of them. But I'm going to say move that from here to the second instance, which would be 10 feet away. OK, and I got a bunch of floor levels here. Now, a couple things to watch out for. Oh, many of the eagle eyed amongst you will notice that I am not showing 75 floor levels over here in the floor plan. You don't really have to. But the reason is, as I created the new levels this way, okay, it wasn't automatically creating new views. I can add new views if necessary. I don't really need it for what I'm going to be up to. If you really wanted to add some more views, I could say view, and then uh, add some more plan views and add those remaining views. But again, you don't really need to. So we could add that, but we're not going to do that. What we're going to do, however, is go to the 3D view, and we're going to choose my towers kind of hanging around over here. And what I'm going to do is say, let's add some floors to it, some mass floors. And to do that, I'll just basically choose all the different floor levels that I want to have included. So I'm going to get all of them. Now, I'm going to choose all 75, even though my tower isn't really 75 floors high. And that is going to allow me, if the tower does grow higher, new floors will be added automatically. So the form is understood as if something will intersect that level, it'll uh, add, add that floor when it hits that level. OK, and again, I'll save this object out in just a second for you. So there I got that nice looking tower with all those floors. Now this is where Revit starts to get to be useful because I can now tell you that that thing has a gross floor area of, what is it, about a million and ninety-three thousand square feet. And that would have been a lot of work for me to go through and compute. Or even better, if I took that tower and said, you know, what if the top rotation were uh, 120 degrees as opposed to 90 degrees? Let do a little regenerating for me. Okay. Again, a very curvaceous kind of structure here, but you'll see that the floor area now is a million and fifty-two. So somehow I lost forty thousand square feet and I didn't have to worry about it too much. Okay. As I change that, though, it's kind of interesting, the whole relationship about floor <coughs> area, volume, surface area. It's not entirely clear sometimes or predictable nearly what these behaviors are, because sometimes it's a little bit subtle. But the idea is, when the interesting towers like this, if you do go through and twist them, what starts to happen is, oh, if this is, for example, a favorable sun face, as you get to the top, these are sort of losing some of the favorability, but some of the ones that kind of creep around the corner and gaining some of the favorability. So it's this really interesting thing that goes on when you start twisting towers about really, you know, what's going to be the best overall kind of approach to either give everyone a little bit of a view or give everyone a little bit of some sun or something like that, as opposed to letting me be the sky. It's also kind of interesting this way as you just move through the day in terms of like really how the sun hits it you know, on all those different surfaces. So the idea is Revit's a really good calculator for helping us evaluate forms like this. <coughs> Let me do the same thing over here. Well, again, just pick the mass floors. This one's a little more predictable. Say OK. So I got a lot of little mass floors in there. 
it. So at this point, let me save this and I'll put it back up on the web for you guys. Just so if you don't have this, you can have it too. Example, twisting tower. Okay. I'll call it in progress. And I'll upload that so you can have it too. So that one should be out there if anyone wants to grab that one and have the same example. So the idea here is really what we want to do is just try flexing some different parameters and sort of seeing what the results are. So as we look at this, you know, for any of these forms, depending upon which one we want to work with, work with maybe I'll do the little twisting tower first, the little rectangular one. We could go through and, for example, Oh, try spreading out the bottom, kind of decreasing the top. We could try changing the twist around there. But as we do those different things, I just want to pull some values out. And whether it's the gross floor area, the gross surface area, the gross volume, or some combination of all three of those values, I can by just using the list map and going through a bunch of the different values. So maybe just as a starting point, oh, we'll try just varying the twist, kind of pull some values out. But then what I want to do is start uh, varying two different variables and kind of seeing what we're doing. We could also start thinking about trying to have different relationships between the values. For example, oh, there's this whole notion of the relationship between the surface area and the volume enclosed, or the surface area and the gross floor area. They're kind of often related. But one way, if you can sort of go ahead and get a lot of floor area, a lot of volume with relatively little surface area, that's typically a more efficient structure. So we can go ahead and play with that and kind of compute the ratio. But it all starts with just kind of setting up a little sys, uh, list map. So let's go over to, if you can, oh, probably 15.1. And we'll see which word I want to jump into this. Let's go out there and in the nearby 15.1. Let's just go ahead and let's start with 1A. That is, we're really just going to go through and select a model element, select some sort of parameter and some range of values, and do some list mapping. And then, depending upon what it is we want to go through and compute, we have some custom node that will do that. Where, in my case, I'm making a custom node, I'm going to pass in the element, I'm going to pass in the test value, and the parameter. So all three of those different things. And out the back end is going to come this updated element and something about like the surface area. That's what we're doing. So let's do that. That's the cookie one right now. In terms of what's inside of this custom node, let's just take a look at that. It's basically going to have the element, the test value as var, the test parameter name, we're going to do the transaction start because we always have to go through and before we change the Revit element, like let it know that that needs to be changed. We need to wait before we get the value. So I'm going to give it like, for example, when I'm changing the height, I guess it is in this case. I'll go through get the value for, in this case, well, the value is the value of the height we're going to be in, the element. Then back out here, we're going to pull out something like gross surface area. So we sort of played around with this uh, a couple sessions ago, but let's just kind of put it all together today. So this is going to get the gross surface area. Let's come back over here. So Ben, just to, to reiterate what this transaction start and that's basically which, whenever it gets to this transaction start, it says don't do anything else until this section is complete. Is that what it does? It's going to be, it's actually before whatever is depending on the transaction end is allowed to go finish everything before it. Okay, but if you had something else running in parallel, 
That would continue to run that at That continues to run at its own speed. So you would have to basically, if you wanted that to wait, is if that ended up depending on this down the road, you, what you'd have to do is have that transaction end also feed into something else in order exactly. to get it started. Okay. It, it, the, the, the game with all this is basically trying to figure out what you need to stick inside of the transaction. Sometimes I just pass things through the transaction yeah. or I'll combine them together with different values only because I really want to wait for yeah. computed value. You could even do something like that that didn't have any dependence, like it didn't do anything. It would just be a... Exactly. So for example, I stop, could, stop, 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 stop. if I had two input values, A and B, and I wanted to change A, but B was going to stay the same, but I didn't want to use B yet, I might put A and B together into a list, pass that into the transaction, then wait to get the result of A updated and the old B and then pull it back apart, only because I don't want to let B do anything yet to them. So and the amount of computing power to just add something to a list like that, it's not going to be very much. Yeah, exactly. So the game with so much of this is really getting Revit to, or you know, really Dynamo to slow down. Because you, you know, often you don't want to get the value until something's been changed. Yep. Yeah, so it's getting it to not race ahead. Yeah. It seems like this would be super useful for, you're going to do this a lot, I think, to actually feed in the Revit rope modeling rather than doing everything in Dynamo. You're exactly. you're not always going to be designing in Dynamo. Oh, no, exactly. Much more commonly, yeah, you're going to be doing most of your design work over here. And then you want to just basically the manipulate model. the model there. Whether we're going to like take a form and look at all your windows and kind of adjusting all the shades or something like that, we'll always be doing something relative to our Revit model. Yeah. Or typically. OK, so let's go back over here and we'll put this all to work. So for my model element, just go ahead and select any of either of them. I'll go ahead and choose a little twisty tower. In terms of the parameter that I want to go through and change, it looks like top height is what I was after. Um, in this case, it's building height, so I need to change that if that's the one I'm going to use. So the parameter that I'm going to change is building height, so I'm going to put that in over here as opposed to top height. Of course, you have to spell it, right? Super. Now we're going to put the range of values that we want in there. So I'm going to let it go anywhere from 100 to sort of 300, going by 10. Okay, that'll actually change 20 different values, I think. Again, go through and often start small and modest as you go through, because uh, if it's going to fail, you'd rather just fail <laughs> once as opposed to, or a few times as opposed to a lot of different times. So. I'm going to put this in as my test parameter name. In terms of the values, I'm going to leave that as the open variable. So that will be the one that gets filled in by the list map. So I come in here and I say, let's give those as the list to the list map. And let's kind of check it out. What we should get out of this is the element surface area. If it is the gross surface area, OK? as a list for each of those, and it should just pop out as a list of all those different values. So let's go ahead and run it. Give it a try. So I see the tower growing over there in the background. Okay, that regeneration, that's happening because of the transaction start and the transaction end. If you didn't do that, it was just gonna race ahead and you'd only sort of see it flash at the end. Okay, so super. We've got some uh, values to work with. Let's see what we got over here on this side. It looks like I have a bunch of surface areas. Now again, because my surface areas are kind of hanging around here and they're looking all naked there, it might be helpful to go through and think about combining them together with the input values, just so you sort of see them. Question? You want to see that's smaller. <laughs> okay, let's see what's going on here. Actually, turn on my mouse. So I'm getting values somewhere around 22,000 in there. Let me pull that over here. Let me shove this one over just so you can sort of see it happening in the cup side. Okay, so if I wanted to actually think about getting some different values, what I need to do is just start playing with the function. 
So right now I'm just basically pulling out a single value of build, or I'm testing a single value and I'm pulling out kind of a single thing, the element surface area. But I can actually sort of start changing this and kind of making this function be a little more fluid for what I want it to be. For example, if I wanted that function to also go through and report the kind of input values, I could go through and change it and say, let's go back over here and add a custom node. And oh, what do I want to do? I get these like uh, set parameter by names and I get the parameter value by name. If I want to pass back two different things as opposed to a single thing, I'm just going to change it around a little bit. What I need to do is I only from the list map could pull out a single thing for every instance. So what I'm going to do is create a little list that has not only the input value that came in, but also the output value so that they come back as pairs. And that'll be something that'll let me kind of keep track of the data a little bit better. So how I would do that if I wanted to get both the input value and the output value is I'd actually just come back over right about in there and say just list create. And all I'm really going to do is say, let's go ahead and the first value is going to be the test value. The second thing in the list is going to be just the output value. Now, if you want to go through and allow that, you can either get just the surface areas alone, or I can get the input-output pairs. I can put another output in there. That'll just give me the option. Pop that over in here. And it's going to call this the input output pairs. Okay. Now we have something that's going to combine them both together. And if you want to test that, just go back over. If I want to see the input output pairs, if that's what I want to do in the list map, what I got to do is basically point to that as opposed to the element service area. It'll always report whatever you tell it to pull out. So if I want to get the pairs, I'll just make the list map go for those instead as the f of x. And I'll let her rip. So it'll still be doing its growing, doing its thing back over there on the outside. But hopefully this time, it's interesting about why it's doing it just twice. Why does it do it twice? That I don't know. That doesn't make sense to me. But here's the pairs, basically 100 map to 22, 110 map to 24, and so on. So when you do that, it doesn't, when you actually feed it to f of x, it doesn't even matter what you give it. It's, that's just going to be what it shows on the map. Correct. But it still runs everything in that custom node. So when you feed a custom node, you really just have to point to the f of x to tell it to run it over and over again. And then you can pull out the rest of the output somewhere else if you actually want to. It's, it's interesting. I, it's, you're always something a very interesting thing about the way to do this. It does actually compute everything. It's just it's outputting whatever it is. So I think all those nodes do get computed, even if they aren't really on the chain that is being reported out there. But if you want to pull them out, okay. you know, what you, you have to do is you, you can't just pull them out now. You have to go through and basically just kind of put them all into a list of different output values. And this is kind of a really good efficiency thing. When I first started doing this, I would go through and I have one thing, oh, I get the surface area of this node. Then I go down and have another list map and you get the gross volume. And that was a very inefficient way of doing it because it would do all the surface areas as a list and it would do all the gross volumes as a list. And it's actually better to do them together. <coughs> you know, because as long as it's running through the list, you really want to change everything that you want to change about the object and pull all the parameters out at the same time because the slow part is regenerating that Revit object. So try to do everything at once if you can to kind of pull the values out of that thing at the same time. 
So for example, so far I have these input output there, they have 100, I have the gross uh, surface areas. If I, for example, wanted to get the volume too, as long as I'm hanging around over here, what I would do is again go back into this node and just say, let's get the parameter value and then add it into the output list and there'd be a third item under each of those. That make sense? Yeah, so when you do the list create within that custom node, yes. it's not actually creating that whole list, it's just creating a list of two and exactly. then list map is what's creating this whole list. Map. Correct. Oh, okay, so if I did another one of those in there, list create to do two other things, yeah. and then try to pull that out, it would only pull off the last <coughs> one unless it was connected. You know it, what I'm saying? It, it will only pull whatever is you know, attached to the output here. Right, that's what I'm saying. So if I had, let's say I had gross floor area, uh, gross surface area, and volume, and I created a different list of three out of the same yes. one, and then just tried to pull that out as a watch, it would only give me the last one out of there. It wouldn't, if, if it wasn't hooked up that's, to this list now. That's actually a very interesting question. Let's just kind of check it, because this is actually sort of a good question to sort of see what actually, what happens to the other things? So it, it just knows it's a function. So, yeah, that's disappointing. But, yeah, you really get into only being able to kind of use the list app to pull these things up. Right. And that's, and that's <coughs> only because that, that was a function, though. Because if yes. we were to run this same custom element somewhere else and not have it attached to this function, it would give us those elements. Oh, correct. Yeah. Yes, yeah. if I just ran it and I plugged in this explicit value, yeah. Then it would do that. In fact, that's what we're going to keep on doing as our big trick to sort of figure out. After we figure out what we like over here, we'll basically reuse that and plug in the good value as the test value, and it'll actually just it'll recreate it at that point. Okay, and to make all the different you know, calculations available. So are those other outputs useless then? When you use it as a list mail? like what is that that function? Oh, well, it just it just really allows us to kind of quickly switch between different things. Yeah. So no, there's yeah, they're essentially useless. Those other outputs well. are useless when you create a custom node to be used as a function though. They're <coughs> yes. they don't give you anything useful. They're just telling it's, you it's or a function. When when you 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 can sort of make these custom nodes do a bunch of different yeah, yeah, things. You and can then, reuse it and but, not but, use it as a function. But, but, but when you use it as a list map, you only get one thing out. Good to know. Okay, so let's go ahead and we'll just adapt this a little bit more. Come back over here and edit my custom node. And for example, if we really want to go hog wild and say that, hey, we got this gross surface area right now, what if we actually wanted to go through and compute, oh, the gross volume or the gross floor area or for all three or even a ratio of all the three of those things, we could do that. And how you would do it is as follows kind of right back in here. The idea is we're still testing that value. We're setting the parameter by name and regenerating. Then for getting values, that can we put as many in here and chain as we want to. We can kind of just have a bunch of them all sort of working. So for this element, we could go through and decide that we want to get the gross surface area, the gross floor area, the gross volume, any of those things. So or let's just go ahead and kind of make it happen. So back over here, I can just copy those and have fun. Pop on down here, say I want that to be the gross volume. Okay, what else do I want? I want the gross floor area too, no worries, I'll copy those. And then I can just add them to the outputs. If you really want to go crazy, you could even, for example, go through and. I realize my definition of crazy has gotten less and less. Um, if I want to do surface area, divide 
divided by the volume of four a or something like that. You go through and compute some sort of a ratio. So I could just say <laughs> surface area divided by uh, oh gross floor area. So I'll put the surface area in there, the gross floor area, and pull that over there. So I can have just all sorts of uh, kind of things being computed by this. And even for this now, input output values. I'll just change that over there just to make it a little cleaner. So the idea of going through and getting a bunch of different values, that actually works out to be pretty easy. Let's go through and do that. That's looking good. Let me go ahead and run this. So let's run started. Don't see much action. There we go. satisfy you that somehow it was doing it for a reason. Well, I don't know. Okay, so now we have a bunch of input values, a bunch of different output values, and now using our fantastic analytical skills, we can go through and do something to that. We could, for example, send those over to Excel if you wanted to. If you're going to send them to Excel, the way this basically works is um, this list in the format that it is, is basically interpreted as rows and columns within rows. So for example, if I wanted to go through and put this to Excel right now, it would be 122 see across, and we could do that. Or we could transpose it, just depending upon what is the, the better organization for what it is you're trying to analyze. But if you're interested in writing it to Excel, it's that ever popular Excel. What is it? Write to file. It has just a few parameters you need to worry about. This stuff is all what I call the data grid. It's the data. Okay. In terms of these other things, oh, there's the sheet name. Actually, I'm going to leave that blank. I think it'll actually complain. I'll probably need to put a sheet late in there. Yeah, start row, start column, overwrite is whether or not it's going to overwrite the existing value. I'll just go ahead and put in, oh, I'm going to put okay, it's in my data results. I'm just filling in some values here. It's zero for the start row and column. If you want it to be there, if you want to kind of plug it someplace else, you can do that. The file path, that's kind of an interesting one. File path is just another function you need to know about. So file path is out here. So we're going to browse to something out there on our hard disk. And what we'll do is we'll go out and browse and actually create a file like something called .xls. And then it will know that it's supposed to write it in an xls file. So I'll say, hey, let's browse. I'll just put this on my desktop, and I'll call it example 151results.xls. That's its magic clue. Then we'll write it over there. So that would write that out. So let's just run this. It'll write it out that way. Now, as it's running, we can think ahead in terms of what we'd like to do. You know, all this 
data that's coming out of us, we can take it over to Excel, we can plot it, we can even go through in here and try to find the maximum value of the fourth number of the ratio. We can find the minimum of something, we can find any of these numbers, but the idea is we could go ahead and based on anything that we find in this results, we could go back and say, great, let's figure out, okay, which had the desirable value and which index gave us that value, which test value gave us that desired value, and then plug it back into our function. You know, the final thing would be to have the building with the appropriate height that gave us that value. Let's see what's going on here. This is interesting in terms of why it's just sort of sitting there. So something started, but I don't know what. In Excel? So. Um, you could put in a header row. Right. You mean like in? Oh, yeah, yeah you could do that. It just as your first, uh, as your, as your yeah. zero index, if you just put in the row. Yeah. Because the way it is right now, it will show input, surface area, volume, floor area, surface area, floor area. Yeah, so let's, let's see my mind's actually just sort of sitting there. <laughs> That's not very good looking. Oh, I bet it's over here. Let me turn off the on the modify mass. Now it's running. This is a funny thing that happens with Dynamo. It's like if you have the mass selected and it says modify mass, it's kind of like it's got its hand on it and won't let you change anything until you take your hand off of it. Okay, so I think it just generated a whole bunch of values. Looks like, well, this isn't happy. Why aren't you happy? That's unhappy. Let's see. This came out available because the license to you, that's funny. My Excel license is expired? Let's see what's going on. <laughs> oh. Activated now. Okay, try again. We're growing. We're sending it to Excel. Now what? What's that overwrite do? It overwrites the values in the same cell. Oh. It's yeah. It would have basically just put it right back in there. Unlicensed product. Why is it saying that? I swear I'm activated over here. Can't get your account right now. I'm there. I'll try it one more time. If not, I'm not going to worry about it. me and my Excel licensing problems right now. Still interesting. Don't know what's going on there. I'll play around with that at the break. Okay. So we can go ahead and write things out to Excel. Your Excel is cooperating with you. Um, what else can we do here? If you wanted to, for example, add your data row, or your header row, which is actually sort of a very good thing to do, you could go through and actually just put a header row on the front of it. And basically, a header row if, would really be just a list that sort of follows the same you know, sort of thing going on in here. So let me think about the easiest way to do that, because it's actually a little strange to do this. And we'll see if I can get this to work right. Oh, I think for a list, what I want to do is basically, I always have to think about that. Curly brackets make lists. So I think it's input value, or, or I'll say building height. We'll just try that. Then I think it's going to be, let me try with a comma in there. Try that. Oh, and I don't even remember what I put in there. It's a gross floor area. If 
probably gross volume. Actually, this gross surface area was the first one, wasn't it? Gross uh, floor area. And finally, the ratio. Let's see if that actually works. If not, I could make a bunch of strings and list create them. I'm trying to be clever, which is usually trouble. <laughs> it's like, let's see if that'll actually work. If I run that, yes, Mr. Unlicensed Excel, I'm going to knock you off over there. What's happening here? That looks like I do have a list there. Pull it out. So I got a list and I got basically five different things in it. I want to basically get it into that other list. So here's what you got to do. This is always a little bit strange if you're doing it because you're doing a funny little list uh, operation. I think what you want to do, oh, this is always funny about whether it's list add out in the front or list join. There's like five different list ways of doing it. And I think this is what I want to do is add this to the front or basically add that to the tail end of that. So let's see if we can make this work. So let me try this and then I'll be proven wrong. It goes like that, and then I'm going to take that list. So that should add to there. The question when I do this is really, am I getting the hierarchy right? Because every once in a while, if the hierarchy isn't right, then the is list will add right. But I think I have a list of all those different sub-things, and this is a list. I'm adding a list at the beginning of the other list. Let's see if that actually worked. Ooh. Not too awfully bad. Okay, so that would actually go through and put them in the right hierarchy. So those would have the headers for those columns. Super. So we're playing around here. We're doing okay. Let us do this. Let us go ahead and take our break right now. When you come on back from our break, we're going to go through and try to extend this a little bit further. We're going to go through and try changing two things at once as opposed to going on one. We're definitely good in terms of changing one thing and getting a bunch of different values back. Okay, And then whether we plot them and figure out some nice graphs in Excel to figure out the right value or we do some mathematical manipulation to try and find the maximum out of this list. Yeah, we know how to operate on that. So let's go ahead and break. Come on back in five. We'll see if I get my Excel working, but we will try setting pairs of items to this or triplets of items to this so we can change several different things at once. I see a lot of concern. So like, is it the list item in the front or? Oh yeah, for this, making the list very quickly, it is just a bunch of strings, but it's surrounded by curly brackets. And that sort of makes a list of things. <laughs> See, that's what, it, that's what it looks like. <laughs> that just is, uh, it's trying to tell me. The gods of the whiteboards are trying to tell me something. <laughs> okay, come on back in five. Let's we'll see if I can get my Excel to work and we will continue.